Good morning to you all. If you are new, I am Jamie, one of the pastors here, and it is my honor and privilege to invite you to point your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. We are um, in the middle of a series that we're working through the Ten Commandments, and we have made up to the Fourth Commandment. So Exodus chapter 20, if you don't have a Bible, there is one provided for you in the pew in front of you. Grab one of the black ones, you'll find Exodus 20 on page 61 of the church Bible. I'm going to go ahead and read verse 1 down to 17. Ask for the Lord's help on our time together, and then we will hone in on the fourth commandment, verses 8 to 11. Exodus chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. Hear now the word of the Lord. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods. Before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you have written these words with your finger upon stone tablets. And now I ask, O Lord, that you would write these truths upon these hearts. These hearts which you have softened to be hearts of flesh. Give us eyes to see the glories of Jesus in these words. Give us hearts ready to receive your word. Give us faith to trust and to believe in you and to follow you. And to love you with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Do this in order that the name of Jesus might resound as praise in all the earth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, maybe I should start out by pointing out what is perhaps not so obvious. God commands rest. 
the Bible commands rest. And how different this kind of thing is from all other man-made religions. Because when man makes a religion, he makes it about working. He makes it about doing. You do what you need to do in order to get right with the deity. And even humanism and atheism do the same thing. Do this and you'll receive this as a reward. But only the Bible teaches. No, no. Rest. I got this. I'll take care of this. Resting is a command of God. More than that, overworking in the Bible is a capital offense. You may have some idea of God in heaven. Scanning the earth with his finger on the trigger, waiting for anyone to have too much fun. That he could shoot and send them straight to hell. But it might surprise you then to learn that God actually requires rest from his people. He requires that they have fun and he requires that they enjoy themselves and that they eat good food, for example. And he builds rest into their weekly calendar, into their monthly calendar, into their yearly calendar. God gives his people all kinds of gifts, and then he gives them freedom and energy to enjoy those gifts and sort of tells them, have at it. Enjoy yourself. No strings attached. I'm a father. You're my children. I just like giving you things. This God is dead serious about his people's joy and rest in him. And truth be told, actually their rest in him was to be the sign that they were his. Some some, some couples get matching tattoos. God gave his people Sabbath, rest. Here's how I want the world to know you're mine. The way you chill. The way you rest. Chilling was their charter. The fourth commandment in the Ten Commandments is about rest. We just read it, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. The Ten Commandments, or sometimes they're called the Ten Words, are a summary of God's Law. It is what governed them as God's people, his people with his particular purpose for them. It's what governed their. Can you imagine if one of the articles of the United States Constitution included language about taking a day off and that it was legislated? That the way that we tell the world what America is about is how we spend our day off? And that it's unconstitutional to not take a day off. But in Israel, that's what it was. Breaking the Sabbath was breaking the law. And it carried a death penalty. It was very serious. And so that begs the question, why is this God so serious about his people's rest? Why would he make rules about resting. Well, we're going to take a look at the fourth commandment. The Sabbath is a big subject. We certainly won't have time for everything the Bible teaches about the Sabbath. However, I trust that we'll spend enough time in this text and by God's grace, we'll find out why it is, what it is, and why it's so important to God, and then maybe a little bit about how we apply that to our own lives. And so here's the outline. You should already be familiar with it. It's the same as we use the other commandments. The fourth commandment explains, the fourth commandment broken, and the fourth commandment fulfilled. So the fourth commandment explained, and then we'll look at the fourth commandment being broken, and then finally the fourth commandment fulfilled. All of this pointing to the main point, which is, you can see this on the slide, keep the fourth commandment by resting in the finished work of Christ on the cross. 
So keep the Sabbath by resting in the finished work of Christ on the cross. So that's where we're headed. But we need to look at the fourth commandment explained first. So let's take a look at verse 8 to 11 again. I'm just going to read all, all these verses one more time. And then we'll work through each one. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your livestock, the sojourner who is within your gates. Verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The reason God cares so much about His people resting on the Sabbath, the reason that He would make laws about it, is what's right there in verse 11, the answer. The word for and the word therefore are very important in the Bible. Those conjunctions are always conjunctions. The reason is right there in in verse 11. But before we get to verse 11, we need to establish some definitions first. So let's start in verse 8 with some definitions. The book of Exodus was written in Hebrew. And and, and this verse is four words in Hebrew. Remember, Sabbath, day, holy. So we'll start with the word remember. The word remember means a little bit more than just call something to your mind. It means to ponder upon something. To think about it. And what this tells us is that the Sabbath, whatever it is, existed before God gave this commandment. Because you can't remember something that you just learned. So Israel must have learned about the Sabbath before God gave them this command. So of course, we know from verse 11 that the Sabbath pre-existed Exodus 20 because it was built into the seven days of creation, but for Israel, the first time they received instructions about the Sabbath was actually in Exodus chapter 16. You can turn there if you want, you don't have to. You can read this this afternoon. God delivers his people out of slavery in Egypt, and he promises to bring them into a special land that he would give to his people, where they would be his people, that he would be their God, and they would tell the whole nation, all the nations of the world about him. And the journey from Egypt to the land that God promised to give them should have taken them about a week and a half. It took them 40 years to get there. Not because they got lost, but because they were lost. You can read about that in the book of Numbers. So God delivers this massive group of people out of Egypt and Moses leads them on a road trip to the promised land through the wilderness. And this is a real story. It's not an allegory. It's a real story with real people who you might imagine a couple of days in the wilderness might be wondering to themselves, who's making dinner? We're hungry. Who's going to make food? Actually, the Bible says they hardcore grumbled against Moses. They were like, we wish we were back in Egypt. Like, I know we were slaves back then and people used to beat us up and stuff, but we had food then. We had meat and bread. But this Moses, he's brought us out here to starve. If I were God hearing that that complaint, I would have sent them fire and sulfur to eat. But I'm not God and God is much nicer than me. He sends them miracle bread. That just sort of, sort of shows up on the ground. He, he sends them game birds to fly over their head and just die midair, fall to the ground. You don't even have to shoot them. And they get up in the morning and all they have to do is gather food and gather meat, all that they need, and go about their day. On the sixth day of gathering, they were to gather twice as much as every other day. Because, and this is... Chapter 16, verse 23, the seventh day is a day of solemn rest, Sabbath. God says, I don't even want you to worry about picking up your food on that special day. I want you to pick up twice as much the day before so you don't have to worry about picking up food on my special day. I just want you to chill. 
I just want you to hang with the fam. I just want you to play with your kids. Call the boys over to just hang at the crib. Just rest. Enjoy me. Enjoy the stuff that I've given you. It's my day. And so here in Exodus 20, God says, remember that day. The Sabbath. The word Sabbath means ceasing. It means stopping. It's, it's literally the day of stopping. Surrender your desire to do and just don't. It's not really a day of can't do's. It's mostly a day where your have to's become replaced by your want to's. Literally, verse 8 reads, remember the day of stopping, keep it separate, because it's really important. So that's what it means, the word holy. Keep it holy. Keep it separate. It's a special day. It's an important day. It's a holy day. It is a day marked by rest and relationship. A day marked by rest and by relationship. By enjoyment, by worshiping the God who has provided all that we have. It is a day to slow everything down and to just trust in the Lord and rest. It is a day of ceasing. Now, maybe we should time out for a second because we're, we're in the Midwest, and some of you might be having a panic attack right now when. The Bible says, don't, don't do, don't work. Verse, verse 9 is coming, so it's not like the hippies are taking over and they're just going to not work and everybody's going to live with their mom and play Call of Duty all day long, okay, and then plead the fourth, right? That's not what this says. It's not about not working. Because verse 9 comes, six days you shall labor and then do all, and do all your work. And, and actually, the, the, the fourth command addresses overworking and underworking together. Because both of them commit the same sin. We'll get there in a minute. So, my fellow Midwesterners, just breathe. Okay, verse 10. The seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. The seventh day is a ceasing to the Lord. So God's people were to set aside one day in seven for rest, for enjoyment, for the Lord, to the Lord. So then what does it mean that the ceasing is to the Lord? How is their stopping something they do or don't do for the sake of the Lord? And I want you to just hang on to that because I told you the answer comes in verse 11. So just hang on to that. We're almost there. First, we've got to look at the rules. The, all the rules in verse 10. The Bible says, don't work. Notice God says, you don't work. You. <laughs> Me? Yes, you don't work. He repeats himself. You don't work. And it's almost as if something, someone is thinking to themselves, all right, fine. I'll just make my kids do it. <laughs> and he's like, no, no. Not your son. Not your daughter. Well, fine. I'll just pay someone. No, no. No, no. Servants are out too. And then you must, so this guy must have been thinking, well, what if I were to find a way to like train my animals to do the work without my help? And he's like, nope, not your livestock either. Even your livestock. They don't work on that day. And then he's like, well, I'm just going to hire it out. I was going to get some foreigner to do it for me. I mean, they don't pay taxes. I don't like that, but I'll just make them do it. And God's like, nope, sojourners are out. Everyone's out. So who, who's going to do all this stuff on the Sabbath? And the Lord's like, now you're getting it. No one works on the Sabbath. So the fourth commandment means that God's people not only partake of rest, but they provide rest. They partake of it. And they provide it. Everyone gets to chill. Everyone enjoys the day of stopping. The Sabbath day. 
is to the Lord your God. So there is something about this day, this day dedicated to the Lord that makes your and my working, their doing on the day offensive to God. There's something about this day that makes working offensive to God. We still haven't answered the question, why is God so particular about rest on the seventh day? Now we come to verse 11. Because, that's what the word for means, because in six days the Lord made everything and rested on the seventh. This is the why. Here's the reason. It's the day of rest for God's people because it was the day of rest for God. God's people cease because God ceased on that day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So God made it holy and God's people keep it holy. God rested on the seventh day. Now, this is a bit of a strange thing, isn't it? God resting. God don't get tired. He's omnipotent. So he doesn't run out of energy. He doesn't need to recoup from a long day. It's not like after a a full day of spinning the galaxies and keeping your crazy life together, he is at the end of the day, just kicks back, puts his feet up, gets a cold drink, is like, geez, golly. I need some rest. God does not rest. So there's got to be another reason why on the seventh day, the Bible says God rested. If it's not for recuperation. God's resting on the seventh day was for enjoyment. God created everything in six days and rested on the seventh, not because he was tired, but to enjoy the work of his hands. The Sabbath day for God's people is God welcoming them to share in his joy in his work. So if you're looking for a definition of what the Sabbath is, it is God's invitation to his people To share in his joy, in his work. It's a bit like a dad who works all day long to build a swing set for his kids. And then just says, have fun. Enjoy yourselves. Enjoy the thing that I made. With my abilities. With my strength. With my tools. For your fun. This is something that God baked into every single week. Every week of their life, they were to rest and enjoy the work of God's hands. Actually, if you look real closely at the creation narrative, God builds rest into every single day. Have you noticed the pattern in the creation narrative? God does all of his work, and there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. God builds rest into everything. When a helper could not be found for Adam, what did he do? He put him to sleep, and from his side, he made the finest work of his creation, the woman. When God entered into a covenant with Abraham, what did he do to Abraham? He put him to sleep, and God cut the covenant himself. God works, God does, and then God invites his people in to enjoy his joy in that thing that he did. The late Eugene Peterson put it so well when he said, every day we wake into a world we didn't make, into a salvation we didn't earn. Creation and covenant are sheer grace. And there to greet us every morning. God creates. God provides. God sustains. And then God welcomes his people into his joy. That is what the Sabbath is. 
your God welcoming you into his joy in the things that he has made, into the work that he has done. That's what the Sabbath is. So then the, the next question I have, I don't know about you, but the next question I have is then, why would anyone break the Sabbath? If the Sabbath is truly just about ceasing in order to rest in all the things that God has provided, relationships, the good gifts that God gives, without having to do anything for it, why would anyone break the Sabbath? Because those of you who've been in the Lord for a while, you've read your Bible, you know, breaking the Sabbath, it's like a big deal. It comes up over and over and over and over again in Israel's life. Why? Well, that brings us to our second point, the fourth commandment broken. And I think you'll see the reasons people break the Sabbath are simple, if not deeply troubling. God's people break the fourth commandment because deep down... They don't trust God. God's God's people break the fourth commandment because deep down somewhere they don't trust God. So this afternoon, if you're reading Exodus 16 and um, just kind of getting an orientation around the Sabbath, keep reading. Read chapter 17, where after, after Israel complains that God, through Moses, was not providing meat and bread, they complain again, this time about Water. And it's the same thing. Moses brought us out here. He's going to kill us. We don't have anything to drink. Their hearts were hard. They doubted God's provision. Even though they had seen the Lord's miraculous work in delivering them. Even though they seen the Lord's miraculous work in providing for them. They didn't believe. And God swore in his wrath. They will not Enter my rest. They didn't trust me. So they won't enter my, not heaven, my rest. So you see that the Sabbath at its core, resting at its core, ceasing at its core, has something to do with faith, with trusting the Lord. Sabbath requires God's people to trust Him. It is one day a week where they are forced to reckon with the fact that they are not self sufficient. Seven days of working would give the impression that they were the ones providing for themselves. And the Sabbath stops that. And they are enforced. They are forced to entrust themselves to the Lord. To entrust their well-being and their livelihood to the Lord. Every single week, one full day to prove to his people I got you. You're my people. I'm going to take care of you. God wanted this principle to be so clear to his people. That he even created a Sabbath for the land itself. So if you're so inclined this afternoon and you're reading, read Leviticus chapter 25. God commands a rest, a ceasing on the land. So for one whole year, God's people were not allowed to cultivate the land, to plant and to gather. One whole year. Now do the math. That's a big deal. (laughs) That means you need one year to provide three years worth of food. So on year six, you need food for year six. And you need food for year seven, where you can't do anything. And because you didn't do anything on year seven, you need food for year eight. 
You see how Sabbath is about trusting? You've got to trust that God is going to do enough in harvest on the sixth year to provide for three years worth of food. Three years of hungry bellies. In Leviticus 25, God promises, I'm going to bless the sixth year. I'll take care of you. But man, the amount of faith that's going to take to not cultivate the land when you live in an agrarian society, it's not like they had a Walmart and Kroger. They could just go get food. The Sabbath is about trusting the Lord as your provider. So the fourth commandment is about reckoning with the fact, with the reality that there is one provider in the universe and he is not us. Sabbath is an atom bomb sent to destroy the pride of man and every notion deep in us that says, if it is to be, it's up to me. Man, this forced stoppage designed by our creator to prove to us our creatureliness is hard for us to swallow. Every Sabbath, the Lord says, I got you. Just chill. And every Sabbath we break, we say, do you though? God meant for rest to establish his people's identity. And they meant for their work to establish their identity. But we all do the same thing. It's not just Israel. Because to our minds, if I do more, then I must be more. If I have more, then that must mean that I mean more. And if that is true, that makes the Sabbath a liability. You see, overworking is about failing to trust in the Lord as provider. Underworking is the exact same thing. Both fail to trust the Lord as provider. So the man who overworks believes that to get the life that he wants, he can't stop. He's too important. His work is too important to him to get the life that he wants, the goals that he's shooting for. But the lazy man makes the same error. He doesn't trust that God will give him the life that he wants, his life of rest. He's going to rest his way. And he underworks. The one man is breaking verse 9, the other verse 10. Both fail to trust in the Lord as provider. Sabbath requires faith. Requires us to surrender control over our well-being. Over the outcome of our work, of our life, to the Lord. It asks us, it demands that we sacrifice the urgency built on our own sense of self-importance and sufficiency. To believe that God will be faithful to his word and provide For his people. That he will bless six days of laboring for seven days of life. And when we act like we can't afford to slow down. We can't afford to enjoy God and his good and varied gifts. When we act like we can't trust him to provide for us. Brothers and sisters, we break the fourth commandment. And let me remind you, the fourth commandment is a Sabbath to the Lord, your God. We break the fourth commandment when our ceasing, when our faith is not for his sake. So that's the fourth commandment explained. That's the fourth commandment broken. Now we turn to the ways in which the fourth commandment has been fulfilled. And no surprise here, we're on our way 
to meet the Lord Jesus. So if you have your Bible open still, please go to Matthew chapter 11. And we'll see how the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled the fourth commandment. Matthew chapter 11, if you're using one of the church Bibles, that's page 816. Chapter numbers are the big numbers, the verse numbers are the little ones, and if you're using the church Bible, this is in the second column, right-hand side, about the middle, way down. We're going to read verses 28 to 30. Matthew chapter 11, this is the Lord Jesus speaking, and he says this to those gathered. He says, come to me, all who labor, verse 28, and are heavy laden, and I will give you, what's your Bible say? Rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find, what's your Bible say? Rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The seventh day of rest was a kindness of the Lord to his people. It was a holy day, special day. But the sun always went down on the seventh day, and it always came up on the first day. The first day always has a way of coming back. We work for six days, we rest on the seventh, but then the new week starts and we got to keep working. There's always more work that needs doing. The rest is never final. And what the Lord Jesus is saying here in Matthew chapter 11 is, it's actually quite profound, if not even controversial. He says, the rest your soul needs isn't with the Sabbath day. It's with me. Rest isn't a day of the week. It's a dependence on me. Come to me, and I will give you rest. He doesn't say, keep my commandments and you will have rest. He says, come to me, and I'll give you rest. So Jesus makes the fourth commandment. He makes rest about himself. And it's not by accident the gospel writer Matthew then goes on to include a couple of sections in your Bible about the Sabbath. Chapter 12, Jesus teaches about the Sabbath. Jesus heals on the Sabbath. Jesus even calls himself the Lord of the Sabbath. And you guys know this, if you've been with us through our series in Luke, Jesus does all kinds of things on the Sabbath. He could have healed any other day of the week. He could have driven out demons any other day of the week. It seems like the man goes around waiting to do all of that and then doing it on the Sabbath just to get everybody riled up. He removed obstacles. He removed man-made laws about the Sabbath. He removed physical barriers, spiritual barriers to his people's rest. I think it can be said that the whole of the Lord Jesus' ministry was about the fourth commandment. About providing rest for his beleaguered people. Come to me and I will give you rest. What was it that took it away? So if God wishes and wills his people to have rest. What is it that takes that rest away? It isn't work. God gave work before the fall. Remember he took Adam, put him in the garden? Work it, keep it. That was before Adam fell. So work doesn't take rest away. Something else took it away. Well, remember I said that the Sabbath is about trusting in the Lord. And so obviously what takes rest away is not trusting in the Lord. Sin. A lack of trust in God as provider. Mankind's first sin in the garden 
And every subsequent sin since is the same. At its core, it is the same. It is to hear God's promise of provision and then to say, will you though? So Adam and Eve failed to trust in God as provider. They broke his commandment to become like him, meaning to become providers like he is. And when you get to Genesis chapter 3, the curse of sin introduces pain into two things. Rest and relationship. And I told you the, the Sabbath is about rest and about relationship, about enjoyment of God. And what does sin do? Sin brings pain into rest, pain into relationship, pain into the relationship we have with God, the connection we have to God, the enjoyment that we have in God. So to Eve, the curse was pain in relationships. Pain in the relationship with her kids and bringing forth kids. Pain in her relationship with her husband. And to Adam, pain in his work. It became toil, frustrating, sweat producing. Thorns and thistles. Sin separated them from God and brought pain into rest and relationship. And here in Matthew 11, you see the Lord is restoring both. Come to me and I will give you rest. If you come to me, that's a restoration of relationship. And having this relationship restored, I will give you rest. And Jesus did this finally through the cross. The Lord Jesus gave his life to suffer the wrath of God for sinners. He suffered the full penalty of sin. He took on the separation that sin produced between God and God's creation. And on the cross, the Lord cried out those three beautiful, life-changing words. It is finished. And they took his dead body off of that cross. And they laid it in a tomb. And on the third day, the first day of the week, he rose again. And he ascended into heaven where he sits now on high, having completed the work that his father sent him to accomplish. This is how the Lord Jesus fulfilled the fourth commandment. He did the work. He became his people's Sabbath. The work needed to restore the relationship and the rest that were broken by sin are restored in him. There is nothing more that needs doing. Everything is finished in Christ. It is finished. And so therefore, brother, sister, there is no more work you need to do to commend yourself to your creator. It is done. Come to Christ. He will give you rest. And this applies to all of us. No matter what you've done. No matter who you are. You don't need to pay God back. You don't need to make it up to him. His mercy is a gift. You receive his forgiveness for your sins freely. And you find rest for your soul. In the same way that God did work for six days and rested on the seventh, Christ has done all the things so that you can rest in him forever. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, sinner, turn from your sin. Listen to the Lord in Matthew 11. Come to him. The rest that you need for your soul, the thing that you've been working for your whole life, will never be found in this life. Because it is found in the man, Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins. Trust in him today and be saved.
There'll be a number of us standing in the foyer on the way out before you leave see us. We would love to talk with you and tell you more about the rest that you can have now in Christ and the rest that you can have in eternity with Christ. It is no accident that Christ rose on the first day. The earliest Christians began meeting on the first day, calling it the Lord's Day, because they understood that in Christ, their new lives begin with rest. Remember, we wake up to a world already made, to a salvation already accomplished on our behalf. The Christian life begins and ends with rest. It's not work, 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 then rest. It's rest. And in that rest, go and tell others about that rest. Christian, your Sabbath isn't resting one day a week in seven. Your Sabbath is resting in the finished work of Christ every day. It is a ceasing from the drive to prove yourself before God by your good works. It is a ceasing from the desire to have everything together. It is a ceasing from the need to feel like you're in control. It is a trusting that God has provided and that God will provide. Sabbath is casting all of your cares on him because he cares for you. Sabbath is knowing Romans 8.32 to the core of your soul. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he, not also with him, graciously give us all things? Sabbath is a recognition that I, I have everything in Christ. There's nothing outside of him that I need. That if this God did all these things to save me, I can rest in him at all times and trust him with all things. It is a freedom to simply rest in his unfailing love, in his kind care, in his perfect provision. And in his security, it is finished. And this means, if you might be wondering, that the Sabbath is not reserved only for those in full time employment, the Sabbath is for every person in every season. Retirees, stay-at-home moms, children, all can enjoy the beauty of the day of ceasing. Because remember, the Sabbath means trusting God by ceasing from normal activity to enjoy Him, to rest in Him. The Sabbath is enjoying the good gifts that God has given. Knowing that you don't have to do anything to earn it. You can just rest in it. You can just play. And that's something we can all do. Christ is our Sabbath. And we get to rest in Him now. And if you're a Christian, you get to enjoy resting in Him forever. Hebrews chapter 4 says that there is a rest still to come. It's referring to heaven. It's true that it is finished. But you know that the effects of sin on rest and relationship are still being felt today. But dear Christian, take heart. One day that will not be. Do you remember playing when you were a little kid? You would spend time 
just playing, not conscious of anything else. You simply played for the sake of playing. No obligations, no expectations. Everything was forgotten. You just played because that's what kids do. They play. And time just didn't mean anything. Do you know what that was? It was a a single drop of heaven on your soul. A microsecond of the eternal rest that is to come. Every Lord's Day is meant by God to be a foretaste of the eternal Sabbath to come. One day in seven to spend enjoying the Father's good gifts. No strings attached. Playing for the sake of playing. One day dedicated to removing all obstacles to your rest in your Savior. And one day dedicated to removing others' obstacles to the same. One day to tell your soul and to those you love, it is finished. Let's play. Let's pray. Father, we confess that we have broken the fourth commandment. We failed to trust in you as our provider, to say that you are our God, and we trust you. We live so much like if it's if it is to be, it's up to me. And we ask that you would forgive us of our foolish pride. And grant to us, O Lord, your people, the Sabbath rest that you have commanded. Cause us to fully trust in you and the finished work of your son. And lay aside every foolish attempt to justify ourselves before you. But simply to come to Jesus. And to receive the free gift of his grace and justification. To take his yoke upon us. To learn from him. And to find rest for our souls. We pray that you would do this. For Jesus sake. Amen. Your assurance of pardon this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 44, verse 22. You can see it on the screen here. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Receive that today. Please stand to your feet.